that there's an, an enormous opportunity to contribute to public health to reduce um, the extent of alcohol-related problems in any society by identifying people who are drinking either at risk, in other words, who haven't necessarily got any problems right now, but who are drinking at levels where their risk of problems in the future is increased. Those people. And people who um, are actually harming their lives um, currently by their level of alcohol consumption. Now, this doesn't mean to say that they're severely alcohol dependent or alcoholics, but there's a whole um, area on a continuum between the kind of people with um, no problems and the people with a lot of problems. So it's that kind of uh, area of the continuum that we've been seeking the assistance of primary healthcare professionals um, to identify and reduce. This has been going on for a long time, 40 years, but it's been extremely difficult to, to get a breakthrough and really to persuade primary health care professionals in general. Of course, these are big generalizations. Some are very keen, some do excellent work, obviously. But um, on the whole, it's been a hard task to persuade them to incorporate this kind of activity routinely into their work activity which we can for shorthand call screening and brief intervention. The way I see them, and I, I've been um, arguing this point for some time in my career, brief interventions really are a whole family of, of interventions of different types um, adjusted to particular circumstances and particular contexts in which they're developed, uh, in which they're intended to be delivered, I should have said. Primary health care is the main. Um, setting for the delivery, mainly because what, what are the figures? Ninety percent of the population turn up to see their general practitioner every year. But other settings are also important. Accident, other medical settings, accident, emergency departments, general hospitals, um, other healthcare settings, even dentists, for example, have an interest because of uh, um, oral cancer is a big problem for them. So they want to make sure that they're patients are not drinking uh, too much for their own good. And going beyond that, even non-medical settings, the criminal justice service, um, the um, universities, uh, educational establishments, social work settings, these are all potential vehicles, if you like, for influencing people's behaviour. Now, nagging. We're not nagging at people. This is not a question of saying, come on, pull your socks up. It's very much a question of giving advice where people want to receive it. If somebody says, look, I don't want to hear about this. I'm quite happy with my drinking. Maybe I drink too much. I don't care. You know, this is my choice. Fine. You know, it's not compulsory. But if you have some doubts about your drinking, if you feel ambivalent about it, then... Um, you know, perhaps we can talk about it. That's the kind of posture we have. Very much not nagging, not dictating, but raising the issue and inviting people to think about it. Overcoming their defensiveness about it is an, obviously an important part, a very difficult part. MI is one of the main vehicles for delivering uh, brief interventions. But even before that started, I mean, motivational interview was developed by Bill Miller and latterly Steve Rolnick, um, after the development of the first brief interventions, historically. So originally, they were just based on cognitive behavioral principles, a kind of condensed cognitive behavioral approach. It was only later, and, and sometimes as well, just simple advice, uh, you know, non-theoretically based. Um, you know, here, here are the test results and here are the results of the questionnaire that you filled in. Um, this shows that you're increasing your risk of harm through your drinking. Uh, you know, what's your, what are your feelings about that? It's just simple advice of that nature. But there's no doubt that mot no, my motivation interview has become the main vehicle of it. And that's, of course, a very difficult thing to do. It's not easy, you know, and you have to have special training for it. Perhaps some people might say you have to have an aptitude for it. And some people are naturally better at it than others. I don't know. But, but at any rate, I think 
going about it because we've got obstacles, that's one obstacle. That's a different thing to raise a sensitive issue like that with somebody on the spur of, you know, yeah. when, when they hadn't expected it to be raised. And it's got to be done very cleverly, very carefully, and so on. And that may be, as well, is one of the obstacles to getting it widely promoted. But I think if people want to increase their clinical skills, that, uh, you know, they should be interested in learning those kind of skills of raising the issue of discussing, thinking and discussing with people and trying to shift them along a continuum of change from ambivalence to making a decision to, to change their behaviour. Perhaps I could have said more in the preceding bit about my brief interventions, is that it's not just a question of medical practitioners either. Obviously there's a whole range of primary health care staff who, who might be involved in this work. So if the doctor, the physician, is too busy, disinclined to do it, at least he or she can motivate other staff or, or, or uh, encourage other staff to be involved. There's no reason why nurses can't, practice nurses can't be involved, and other types of uh, primary health care professionals. And of course, the big advance uh, in recent times is the availability of um, digital intervention. So, and, and leading patients instead of doing work face-to-face. -face. I mean, I think the evidence shows that some face-to-face -face contact is necessary. You can't shove a person in front of a computer and let them get on with it. But you can save a lot of resources and make a lot of shortcuts by, by using digital interventions. I mean, somebody at this, uh, the Centre for Addiction and Mental uh, Health, um, John Cunningham, has been one of the leaders in this field. And, uh, you know, I think that's a very exciting prospect, not just for um, internet intervention, for people doing it on their own, which is important, but also for primary health care uh, practitioners to use those kind of internet facilities to, to advise patients and, uh, and help them change. One obstacle, uh, conceptual obstacle to all this work is the continued notion, the fixation people have on this idea of alcoholism as being the only type of problem that exists. And, um, you know, this has been going on for a long time as well. And fortunately, every time a celebrity or a sports star comes out with, uh, you know, their conv I'm not knocking at them, you know, people got their own solutions to find, and if that suits them, that's fine. But the publicity given to the alcoholism concept in this way leads to many people in the community including professional workers as well, to think that that's the only kind of problem there is, you know. When we, and we really want to get people away from that into a whole spectrum of alcohol-related problems, types of problems and severity of problems as well, that uh, in aggregate are a much larger, um, cause much more damage in society because there are so many people who suffer from them without having that severe form of alcohol dependence which people naturally call alcoholism. So we, want, we don't want to ignore people with those severe problems, not at all. More funding should be directed to helping them. But we want to move the focus of society and of professionals in the field to this broader spectrum of alcohol-related harm in society. Well, I've just produced a a collection of uh, essays um, last year with a guy called uh, Gabriel Siegel, who's a philosopher, actually. And um, this is something that I, I, an interest I developed when I stopped working for the NHS and I had a bit more time on my hands. And what it's, it's saying is that um, there are two kind of errors you can make in thinking about addiction. One is the the mistake of thinking that it's completely compulsory behavior, and automatic behavior. There is no choice whatever, uh, which I think is absurd. But unfortunately, is the impression that many people uh, receive, including people with problems, so that there's a disincentive for them to change, because they've been told, oh no, I've got a compulsion, I've got this disease of addiction, which means I'll be unable to change. Between that on, one, on the one hand, and the idea on the other hand that it's a completely free choice, that it's all a myth, you know, that addiction doesn't exist, it's something just made up um, for certain reasons. We say that the truth lies in the middle somewhere, 
we don't dismiss the concept of addiction, not at all. Addiction is the difficulty people, special difficulty people have in changing their behavior. But we say that the truth exists between those two extremes. So, I mean, a convenient phrase is from, um, you know, the, who is it in uh, Romeo and Juliet who says, a plague on both your houses. We want a middle course between these two extremes. So the book is called Addiction and Choice, rethinking the relationship between addiction and choice. And there are philosophers, Philosophers are very interested in addiction because it poses a, a very interesting problem for them and have been interested throughout the ages, right? Since the ancient Greeks, actually. But anyway, so they're very clever philosophers giving their views on this problem. Neuroscientists as well, right? because there's a lot in common with some new scientists who um, regard addiction as some kind of disorder of self-regulation, right? Psychologists, um, lawyers, as well, commenting on the implications for law of this. So that's um, a book produced by Oxford University Press. It's rather expensive, I'm afraid. Um, I don't expect to make any money out of it, so I have no commercial interest or very little in this. But I am interested in getting the ideas across and getting some debate across. I really do genuinely think we're at a crossroads in thinking about addiction. I think of some of the old simplicities and frankly, crudities in thinking about addiction um, are beginning to be replaced for a more uh, refined and more thoughtful analysis of the nature of the problem. At least I hope so, and I hope that our book is a contribution to that.